There never feels like a good time to step away from Crusader Kings 3. It's one more crisis syndrome and I've got it bad. Anyone who's played CK2 should be familiar with the ailment and well prepared for the sequel. Once again, you're the head of an early medieval dynasty, and you'll try to keep it trucking for as long as you can by clicking away on an elaborate map and a big stack of menus. Your tools are diplomacy, intrigue, warfare and luck, and your goals are whatever whims your mind conjures up. Imagine The Sims, but you've got 20 people in your house, half of them have STDs, and the others are plotting a coup. Crusader Kings has always been about characters instead of nations, but they've never seemed so rich and so maddeningly real before. They might be greedy, cruel, pious, horny, perpetually drunk, if you're looking for an adjective you'll find it. Everything is a root cause, something that the trait can be traced back to, like a childhood bully or a battle that went badly, creating characters moulded by their past. They start developing before they're even born. Parents can pass on congenital traits to their children that can be strengthened over generations, letting you promote things like intelligence and symmetrical features through arranged marriages and bad science. Inbreeding is one way this can be done, a perfectly normal thing to say in a video game review. But that's a ticking time bomb. One of my rival dynasties ended up almost destroying itself by keeping it all in the family, which made a whole generation almost entirely infertile. Big Game of Thrones fans. To really make a mark on the world as well as keeping your unruly dynasty in check, you first need to focus on beefing up your ruler and hitting some personal milestones. Thankfully there's always one event or another hurtling towards you with opportunities for growth. You might walk into your bedroom one night and find a member of your court molesting one of your shoes or chamber pots, at which point you can chase them out or call the guards but you might instead decide that actually fondling random objects is very much your kind of thing, and voila, you've got a new hobby. More wholesome events include having a really nice conversation with a new friend and getting a really cool dog. Lifestyles let you chisel away at your rulers without having to rely on random events. They're like classes, each representing one of the game's skills. Through education, everyone has an inclination for a specific lifestyle, but you can pick whichever one you want. Each is split up into areas you can focus on, giving you a persistent bonus and letting you start to earn XP that can be used to unlock perks from the lifestyle's three trees. Where its predecessor took a lot of inspiration from RPGs, this is a full RPG progression system that's fueled by stories rather than kills and quests. The most insidious threat to a ruler is stress. It's what keeps you honest, or cruel, or greedy. You gain stress whenever you act against your personality. If you're chased and you start rolling around in the hay with a courtier, you're going to be racked with guilt. You can even die from stress. So there is more weight to these choices, more risk, and the price of free will is the constant threat of an existential crisis. While you can spend incalculable hours wrapped up in role-playing and intrigue, there is also a huge simulated world to paint in your colour. It's a sprawling kaleidoscopic map that stretches from Iceland to Nigeria to Tibet, and what were often tiny bits of land with few identifying features in CK2 are now large regions with their own character. The expanded map also means more tactical wrinkles that make fights less of a pure numbers game with specialised troops and more powerful knights giving you distinct advantages. There are other ways to conquer the world that don't come with the responsibility of managing an empire that spans continents. You can expand your dynasty to every corner of the map without gobbling up every county. You can use marriage and inheritances to place your relatives in seats of power outside your own realm. Powerful members of your dynasty might also decide to form a cadet branch, getting out from under your influence and gaining control over the family members in this new house. You're not sacrificing power, you're dividing responsibility. Other houses and independent rulers contribute renown to the dynasty, and as the head that means you're able to throw your weight around and spend that renown on dynasty-wide legacies. Think perks, but they're permanent for the whole family. Eventually you can build a dynasty of warlords or ensure that the realms under your supervision run with machine-like efficiency. It's been a huge relief to let some other characters do the heavy lifting. Leading a dynasty to immortality is exhausting, but now it's a team effort. Spreading it lets you enjoy the hit of power and rush of expansion, but doesn't ditch you with a whole host of new administrative problems. All of the glory, but not quite as much of the hard work. It's the dream. 
The loftiest ambition is, of course, trying to make everyone agree that your god's the best one. Or you could get in on the medieval era's biggest craze, heresy. Religion in Crusader Kings 3 is vastly influential and usually chock full of rules that ruin everyone's fun. They're strict and way too interested in what people do in their own bedrooms, or sometimes the beach, and once behind the stables. Your new faith can get rid of all that. They're built out of tenets that come with special mechanics and doctrines that determine the legality of things like same-sex relationships, who can become a priest, and if divorce is okay. Making a new faith is a lot like creating a new culture, but there's also a discrete culture system that's tied to innovations. New laws, unique units, and special bonuses can be unlocked over time for everyone in the culture, but only the dominant ruler can actually pick what innovations to focus on. Even research becomes another source of competition and intrigue as you try to keep your fellow rulers behind you. Just as new faiths keep popping up, new cultures can also appear and start challenging their more established neighbours. Crusader King 3 is always in motion, always jumping to new stories, so it never lets you get too settled. It's an irrepressible story engine that spits out a constant stream of compelling alt histories, delightfully infuriating characters, and social puzzles that I've become obsessed with unravelling. I can't imagine being done with it, I just subsist on this digital drama now. Will Alfred finally leave the torture chamber and make a new friend? What's Bjorn going to do now that he knows his wife is in love with the Chancellor? And who's going to be committing patricide next? I need to spend less time recording reviews and more time with my dynasties.